what I wanted to do in this first segment, since we're talking about, uh, we're talking about, uh, I guess, broadly Oktoberfest, though we don't need to address that necessarily as a cultural holiday, though you may if, if you'd like to. Uh, what I wanted to do is to introduce you two uh, to the audience to discuss uh, not, I mean, you could bring up role playing and whatnot, but I, we'll transition into that in a little bit. I, I, I oh, you mean tabletop. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, sorry. Uh, but, but I'd like you two to talk about yourselves, uh, you know, what got you into brewing, into, uh, into doing this, uh, personally and, uh, and professionally or as a professional hobby or however you're, you're relating yeah. it. I, I want you to just open up about yourselves a little bit as we, uh, l let's just sit at the table. Uh, I don't have beer with me, unfortunately. I forgot to go shopping, but I have a big pitcher full of ice water. Uh, so cheers to you here, but let's have a little bit of table talk first and discuss, what gets someone into brewing, and then we'll expand from that in the in the following sections and uh, talk about uh, real life brewing and and you know what what is a brewer's kit in D and D or things like that. Cool. Yeah. Um. I think uh, Greg, you can back me up on this. We've both been sort of semi professional alcoholics for the better part of our adult lives. Um. Yeah. I I switched. Um. I I switched my my libation of choice. Um, sort of about a... six years ago. Prior to that, I was very much a... Uh, I was a vodka and something drinker. And yeah. um, for a birthday... Was a wine party, yeah. Uh, and actually, technically, it was 2006, so it was 12 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. But I went out for a birthday dinner with some friends, and we went to a restaurant, and somebody thought it would be funny to get me a, a beer with more alcohol than a bottle of vodka had. Mm -hmm. And... And it turned out to be the Amazing. first the first beer I'd ever consumed that I didn't think tasted like cat piss. Yeah. Um, well, and it was, was probably the first beer. Well, it you was. Ever had. No, I I drank a lot of beer before that, but it was the first one I ever drank and said, "Can I have another?" Ah. Uh, this was, and and it was specifically, it was a Huygens brewery, a, a Dutch brewery, a beer called Delirium Tremens. Uh, blue can, pink elephants, and they're dancing. And that's really all you need to know for the branding. Um, yeah. That beer uh, at 13.5% alcohol, um, it's a big uh, sort of a Belgian triple kind of beer. Um, flavorful and and interesting and um, depth of flavor. And I sort of went, well, hold on a minute. Beer is supposed to be yellow and kind of tastes like pee and yeah, make you burp a lot, yeah, get, isn't get, it? Kind of generic, like Budweiser and whatnot, or Bush. Exactly. That, that's what beer is. That, that, that's all the beer has ever been. <laughs> well, that's all the beer has ever been in, in America. And I think that's that was sort of the, the beginning of my journey into beer was understanding that I had it all wrong for most of my life. Yeah that I didn't really understand what beer was because all I'd ever consumed was Bud Light or, or, uh, Canadian Coors or Canadian or Bud or Bud, whatever flavor of the week, like PBR or, well, P PBR was, he couldn't even find it when I was, you know, a young lad, but, and I, and I still maintain that Coors Banquet's not a terrible beer. Uh, I agree. It, it, on a, patio in the summertime when you're mowing the lawn it's ideal <laughs> um so that was kind of what happened was i i had sort of been introduced to this and then i went and started looking at beer and so the following i guess two years later at a birthday party my wife told everybody to bring craft beer so i ended up with you know 20 bottles of something different and i realized that that what i had built this little tiny little you know basket of this is what beer is um she just opened the opened the the drawstrings on the bag of holding that yeah. was what craft <laughs> yeah. beer really is the seal wow. was broken and and i and i say that you know jokingly because we're you know we're you know rpg fans here but the truth is um in my mind there is absolutely no end to what that can be there is no end to what beer can be. It just hasn't been brewed yet. 
Um, oh, I really, and I really so like that outlook and attitude. Well, that's what that's what got me brewing because I started to realize that if there is this spectrum of flavor, um, from right from the Bud Light to that Delirium Tremens that I'd had to the ultra, you know, nearly treacle um, uh, barley wines that are out uh, to the big, big, rich, smoky, bitter, you know, dark stouts there's certainly a bit of variation to explore. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I'm not great in the kitchen because I'm too lazy to clean up, uh, <laughs> but one pot and some fire and I'm good and I can make whatever beer I want. So that and, was and sort of how enough, Greg, that that's, role. That's, that's sort of exactly my situation too, is I was like, I've got a wine fridge in my house and I'm, I'm was a really big wine enthusiast, if you will. Um, and at a certain point, wine can only do so much. Um, and then for some reason, Greg, we, we, we were um, we were affiliated through a, a previous endeavor. And Greg's like, dude, go buy this, this, and this. Mm. So I was like, okay, I bought... Um, uh, a beer called Kentucky Bastard, which is like a 12% humongous, crazy-ass beer. Best thing I've ever had in my mouth. <laughs> and like a, a Belgian or, or something you know, like that, but but, but a, sort of a broad range. He's like, go go buy these, you know, these three styles. Anything in these three styles. And, yeah, I've probably had five glasses of wine in the last six years because... You, you can't can't beer. match beer works beer. better. Mm. Yeah, beer, and beer it works take better. Take as long to brew, if I recall. Yes, um, beer is brew. <clears throat> beer can be as fast, uh, depending on how you want. Okay, so I guess in a, in a we should probably talk about if you know if we're going to discuss beer in any category we should probably talk about what it is and how it gets to be what we think it is and if yeah. we do that that'll give us all a little bit better perspective on some of the things that Luke and I are going to say cuz we're going to say some things that yeah. sound a little unreasonable and silly but there's a reason so we're going to use some words that don't make sense yeah but, so um beer beer is sort of got um three stages like broadly um, and, and a couple of components. Um, you've got your your grains and, and waters, so your base elements, right? Okay. Um, that, would, that would also include hops. And um, you combine those together with water. Water? Water? Um, water? You're watching too and, much Bon Appetit. Yeah. Um, like... Basically, brewing beer in a nutshell is making good-tasting sugar water that um, an organism called Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Did I say that right, Craig? I'll give it to you. <laughs> I, I always, I always screw up. It's, it's yeast. It's yeast. Um, it's yeast. Yeah. Yeah, and the the. Depth of grains and hops and yeasts are almost without end. Um, there's infinite combinations. Um, and that's how the art or the real life RP of creating your perfect brew comes in um, is you combine those elements. So you've got elements, then you've got the sugar water, and then you take the sugar water and you introduce our little yeasty friends and that creates your beer. Mm. Yeah. So in terms of, of, um, you know, how long and, and time and things like that, depending on the desired product, it can be yeah. very, very short, uh, or it can be quite long. So, um, if we look at, the traditional brewing of beer in Samaria and in Egypt five, six, seven thousand years ago, um, bread, so milled grains, 
um, which had yeast in them, were soaked in water, and then that was allowed to ferment. Mm. And that made alcohol. Uh, the combination of the bread and that made this nasty, soupy, yeah, like really, really weak oatmeal <laughs> with, <laughs> yeah. with, with alcohol in it. Back then they used a grain called emmer. Um, it's starting to find some resurgence now in the U S but it's, it's considered an ancient grain. Um, and, and it was a distant relative. Emmer's a distant relative of barley. So they're very similar, but the point is that they were extracting the sugars uh, by soaking it in water under the right conditions, go figure. The it, right happens to be, it happens to be warm in Egypt, so that just worked to yeah. their advantage. Uh, and then it was covered and allowed to ferment for about three days, and then that liquid was poured off, and that's how the workers who built the pyramids were paid. They were paid because that was food, and it yeah. served more than one purpose. It served the purpose of feeding the slaves that were building the pyramids. It also served the purpose of hydrating them mm. uh, because water is a lot harder to come by than people realize. We think about when we're playing, um, you know, that 5e campaign or that 3-5 campaign and, oh, you know, grab a sip of water from the wineskin or whatever. Mm. I've got a bag of water. Where did it come from in an yeah. environment where this type of thing was not there. I don't seem to recall a lot of instances in D and D, particularly where somebody was doing molecular biology, was doing invertebrate biology, was doing yeah. yeast culturing. Probably not. Beer existed in that time yeah. because the production of it purified it, and yeah. it was that it's, like very beer, beer was beer was. Was the water preferred beverage because yeah. the water would kill you because you'd get dysentery if you drank the water, but yeah. you wouldn't get dysentery because the alcohol kills off anything in the beer or anything in the, the liquid. So, um, so there was that three day variation, and it was sort of a couple of thousand years, um, during which the real purpose of creating that beverage was to have clean, safe drinking water that wouldn't make you sick. And you got a buzz off of it, and that made you passive. And yeah, you know, it wasn't high and, alcohol, and so there weren't a lot of to, drunk battles, right? To to this day, there are still parts of the world that we live in where it's a, a practice to make the water not brown. Yeah, like if and, you're if you're going to boil the water anyways, yeah. you might as well throw some grain in it and yeah, have stuff for food and stuff for drink. So, yeah, and that's um, and that's a, I think a, a really important thing to sort of grok. I mean, <laughs> wine wine can be made in a few weeks if you don't want good yeah. wine. Uh, if you just want drinkable wine, what probably two to four weeks, Luke, somewhere in that neighborhood, Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> a if, good if you want to if you want to not puke, you should probably. Probably two months. Yeah, two months. Um, the beer that I'm drinking right now, okay. uh, perfect example. Uh, this is a black lager. It could have been an ale. It doesn't make a difference in terms of, of making the beer, only what bug I feed to it to make me alcohol. Um, but this <laughs> beer was brewed on a Sunday night, and it was done fermenting six days later. And two weeks after that, it was in a keg, and now it's fizzy and happy. Is that? Uh, did, did you call that one Solomon Grundy? Believe it or not, this particular beer, <laughs> if you know this beer poem. is named A Leaf on the Wind. Uh, oh, yeah. a man of culture, I see. Yeah, we've, we've been talking about that beer for quite a while. That, does, um, that, does that have a good burn? You know, like just like something in your chest, just kind of like, you know... Uh... <laughs> I, I I I specifically built this beer the way I did because Hoban always wanted to go to the black because he couldn't see the stars from his hometown. I and that was and that was where this came from. There's lots of little stars in there and it's black. I have, uh, I have the the next beer that I'm brewing is uh, the grain is sitting in the bucket just behind the camera and that beer is called Replicant. Ooh. So we, yeah. So it's not just fantasy. Again, we, we could we could draw nope. the uh, the future into this, and uh, and it'll be. Uh, I, I think this is. 
I think beer, uh, alcohol broadly, beer specifically, it is a part of our culture as human beings. Um, yeah. Almost every culture embraces alcohol in some way. Yeah. Um, and and with it being a part of history, with it being, um, uh, it, it's mentioned in, in so many different uh, religions and cultures, and um, it, it's something that is going to, it's just going to exist until we stop. Yeah, and and I think that speaks a lot to its purpose uh, in terms of cultural importance. Um, it's culturally important everywhere. It's culturally relevant in all of these places, in all of these environments, and in all of these cultures because it served the same purpose. Whether yeah. you were Scottish Highlands or whether you were walking across a desert or whether you were mashing through a jungle, safe water required treatment. And yeah. treatment could only be achieved in two ways. Boil it, add, or put something or add alcohol. It, or put something in it that kills everything off. And that's yeah. the alcohol. Uh, there are there are beers uh, made in Peru today and in Chile today uh, that require the use of human sputum. Oh, okay. Because well, if you think about the the process that actually creates beer, it's a it's a two stage process. You have grain that you need to extract sugar from into water, and then you feed that water feed that water to yeast. If the grain that you are using doesn't have an enzyme capable of making sugar from it, then you, you got have one in to your face. Add that. And it just so happens women have lots of it in their mouth and men have a little bit. So what you find is in places like Peru, uh, chicha is made with cornmeal. Okay. Yeah. And women are the brewmasters because those women have the right enzymes to let the starches in the corn break down and turn into sugar. So even culturally... The type of grains that grow natively, the type of people that are responsible for manufacturing this product, it hasn't changed for a thousand, thousand, thousand years. Yeah. yeah see, there, there, there are grain houses in Belgium that have been operating for 300 years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, culturally, that's, that's where that significance comes from. When we talk about going to the inn and asking for a flagon of ale, it's because nobody in their right mind would ask for a glass of wine. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Uh, you yeah. know, uh, magic may exist uh, in, to some degree, uh, mm -hmm. or, or even some semblance of technology, but uh, that creek running by the, uh, by the old tavern uh, is probably also a latrine. A um, beaver fever. Uh, for for people <laughs> or, or for or, and or nature, or yeah. as you're talking about earlier, if um, if uh, actually ooh, where I live in Sandusky, Ohio, uh, there yeah. is a fantastic uh, uh, high quality limestone that exists under our soil, and that's uh, due to the ice age and scooping out the lakes and all that other stuff. Yeah, and as a Canadian, you're welcome for that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you and you're uh, welcome for the water that flows through it yeah, <laughs> yeah. um hey yeah we, we we get alberta cutters and and all sorts of nor'easters and and uh you, you guys are well i i guess you're to the west but you're you're at least have the north part uh that you send down our way um well so one thing that uh the limestone can do it can uh filter water over time uh, but something else it, it can act is like a watershed, right? It, it'll it'll trickle down through the soil yeah. and then wash yeah. out. Well, yeah. when Sandusky, which we just celebrated our 200th uh, uh, birthday uh, this year, um, when Sandusky was founded, uh, a couple years after that founding, uh, there was suddenly a uh, a cholera outbreak. Uh, or, or was it dysentery? I, uh, well, anyway, so what was happening... Was people were buried, but the water wasn't filtering down. Uh, instead, it was it was going through the soil where people were being buried. The water was permeating the caskets, and then you had uh, you had dead material uh, being uh, sluiced out into the lake, and people were fetching water from the lake. And so, as uh, as shit. and and so what yeah. happened was uh, the, our area had a big cholera epidemic, and. And in fact, many people say that Sandusky would have been 
a Cleveland or a Toledo if it wasn't for that outbreak. And so what the city had to do was move the, the city cemetery from being like whatever, 200 feet or so from uh, the lake. And they moved it about a mile and a half, uh, two miles inland uh, to yeah. make sure that, you know, cause water is just that, or, you know, look at the, we talk about in the great lakes, the algae problem uh, that we're yep. having for various reasons. And that's absolutely correct. Uh, in, in a D and D setting, uh, if you are living in a first world country where water is accessible, you don't often think about it because uh, there's other mm-hmm. alternatives. But uh, when was the last time you ever did order a water in D&D or to go back one step? When was the last time you ever described your character having to take a, a pee out in the woods or, or you know, to, to manage your mm-hmm. waste? And where does that go? What does that affect? Mm-hmm. The, uh, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's it's interesting. It's an interesting thing, and it, and and I you know I said it, but I hadn't really given it a lot of consideration. Uh, but I mean, yeah, the water that we consume um, as characters, I think we completely take for granted. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, we just assume that question. we have you know water with us. But it was never you know it, it's either that or we intentionally we have ale because we're playing a dwarf and that's what they drink, or we have wine because we're a E word person, and that's what they drink. <laughs> um, but but it's because you know there's this you know we make it a special thing. Yeah. Um, but the reality is that in a world that doesn't have any right, yeah, there's magic, and sure, I'm sure there are alchemists who know how to purify water, and I'm sure there are just smart people who know how to use carbon layers of charcoal and and peat to filter water to make it safe. Um, but those would likely be few and far between. Yeah. yeah. The average, you know, and uh, it certainly it certainly wouldn't be done on a scale for every single adventure in a realm to have an unlimited yeah. supply of. Whereas a wine skin of young ale, yeah. um, is absolutely possible um, and probably preferable because it would provide not only that. You know, a little bit of extra liquid courage, perhaps, but it would also provide that hydration and it would provide calories. Um, and low alcohol beers are, are sort of the common. Um, two to three percent is sort of the typical ale that you would see um, 300 years ago um, in terms of, of um, replacements for table water. Uh, they were called mm-hmm. table beers and they were used because that's what you would drink when you had lunch. Uh, mm-hmm. Because you wouldn't want to try and purify water just to have a sandwich, right? right? And so farmers would take a jug of that out, you know, with them on the cart when they went to, to work their fields or tend to the animals, and they would sit down with that at lunch, and that's what they would have. Um, it, it was um, a bready sort of affair. Um, it wasn't yes. uh, a traditional clear, bubbly, effervescent. Mm-hmm. Um, it was more like a kind of slightly boozy oatmeal that was really runny. Some, uh, well, it, some people was, do call beer liquid bread. It, and that's why, right? Uh, that's hey, absolutely Greg, why. I think, I think we, should, we should touch on a little bit, too. Um, yeah, a, lot, a lot of the RP experiences that I've had, <laughs> the terms um, mead and beer are sort of universally yeah. changed. Yep, yeah, for in, sure. In RP world, and I think it might be beneficial if maybe we, we talked for couple minutes on the differences and why there's differences and then we could touch on brackets too uh yeah um so that's sort of the three classes of typical agrarian alcohol uh prior to the age of distilling which is i mean yeah. also a couple hundred years old plus now but um the differences uh are Basically fairly where, simple. where you where you get your sugar yeah, it, it ultimately comes down to where you get your sugar. So there's, you know, natural sources of sugar that we think of, um, you know, what is the most common sweet sugar you can think of in nature? It's honey. Uh, yep, yep. You know? And, 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 uh, and honey, so, uh, you go back to a lot of historical records uh, yep. and, and mythologies and religious stories, um, and bees and honey have been, they've been around. They've been around for as long as, uh, don't have a lot of those in Egypt. Uh, and so in places like, you know, Africa and the Middle East, 
they used what they had, which was grasses. So it was grains. Hmm. Um, but everywhere else, uh, a lot of this started with honeys. Uh, and that honey, honey wine, as it's referred to now, was meat. Um, you mix four parts water with one part honey, you let it ferment, it turns into meat. Um, and mead, you literally can just put it in a jar, let it do its thing, and it will still itself out in, you know, four to six weeks. And you've got a 7% alcohol beverage that is safe to drink. Huh. Um, Braggot is the next step in the chain. So in those places like uh, Wales, for example, where grasses don't grow well, but they do grow. Um, there are grains. Barley was one of the sort of staple grains in the British Isles for a long time. Um, so barley was there, but they also had a lot of honey, had a lot of bees. They had a lot of flower, um, flowering species mm -hmm. in the in the rolling hills, particularly in Wales. Um, and so the mead that was made would often be mixed with the beer, and okay. it would it would create a beverage called a braggot. Um, B R A G G O T. Um, oh, also is it, referred... is it someone who brags? Uh, that's a brag art. Oh, okay. this is a brag art. Okay, so no R. Um, in R. in older text, it's referred to a, as a bragged. Um, B R A G G O W D. Hmm. Yeah, and that's sort of the typical Welsh pronunciation. But they What's were. Um, yeah, they were a more table version of a mead. So you would you would feed a child a braggot, okay, but you yeah. wouldn't give them mead because they would get drunk. But a braggot, you've got you know mostly beer and a bit of mead. So the mead provides the sweetness, so, and the beer provides the sustenance. So think of um, in in period RP. Think um, Heather is actually Shlomo. Just to comment, Shlomo uh, Heather is actually a very common ingredient in braggots, as is pepper, white and black pepper. Huh. Um, so, so in RP, think of uh, beer or ale as water. <clears throat> okay. Straight one to one replacement. Mead is whiskey. Mead is whiskey. Yeah. Mm. All right, and, and, and wine and, is and a braggot is sort of halfway in between. Yeah, um, what is the one? What do you call the one with the apples? There's another name for an apple one when you mix cid a cider. Uh, oh, with um, a beer. Um, terrible! It's a um, silly name, and I hate it. Uh, but I can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, that's another lambic, one, right? <laughs> no, 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 it's not a lambic. Bite your tongue. Yeah. Uh, uh, to the internet. <laughs> got to go to the internet, man. Hey, you know, we, we've learned a lot over the last 10, 12 years. I've learned a lot over the 10, 12 years. And Luke's lear learned a oh. staggering amount in his last few years. Um, I cannot remember what it's called. Somebody well, in the I'm chat not... will get it. When, uh, w when I... It's... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, but it wasn't very common in Europe because apple trees uh, were sh were few in number and tended to be owned by wealthy landowners. Mm. They weren't just random apple trees popping up in the forest all the time. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there you go. Look it up in that book. Um, and so a cider is, a, is specifically an apple or a cherry. Um in terms of, of those, those boozes, but they, they were much more rare, um, I think, compared to an, a, an ale, a warm fermented, and we'll talk about ales and lagers at some okay. point through this conversation. Yep, that's but perfectly fine. Um, but uh, they, were, uh, they were traditionally a warm fermented uh, uh, grain beer, so, whisk, uh, so wheat or uh, barley, uh, or they were a honey, and then the braggot mixed the two. So then you've got that that sort of scale. And the way it worked was when a braggot was made, the first mix of that, which was the highest alcohol content, uh, was really like 9%. Used, yeah, and it was actually used as payment for rent. Yeah. That is how most landowners paid landlords, was wow. in alcohol. And tribute to the church and stuff like And that. tribute yeah. to the church yeah. and tithes and things like that. The second cut was used for guests. Yeah. Um, 
and those guests typically like a four a four to five percent. Yeah, four four and a half percent. Yeah. So you'd have the noblemen would be drinking <clears throat> eight eight percent, nine percent yeah. big beers and slow with the clergy. Point. And then if you went to visit somebody, you'd get the, the four to five percent and then as Greg mentioned earlier, they'd run water through it one more time mm. and do the process again and you'd get your two percent strictly better than water that you'd drink all day. Yeah, and that would be the table beer. That's what would be sitting in a jug on the table if you came in from work and you were thirsty or if the kids wanted something to drink because the alcohol content was very, very low. Um, yeah, and that, and that stems from the brewing process, right? Yeah. The brewing process. Um, uh, at the time, you wanted to get as much as you could possibly get out of that grain. So you would actually do a brew two or three times with the same grain and the first cut of it would be really boozy, lots of sugar. The second cut, not so much, and the third would be much more watered down. It, um, it sounds similar to, uh, there's some other foods, and like olive oil came to mind, where you have like extra yes. virgin olive oil. That was, the, yep. that was the, the top, that was the first press, and that is the highest quality that the nobles would have been given or afforded. And so exactly. it, it's similar. it sounds similar in this instance as well. It's killing Luke that he can't find the name of that drink because we both know it. I got, I got pissed off when I looked up party. It starts with a G. It starts about. with a G, Luke. Yeah. It's not a. Is it a Groot? Is it Grog? I, no, you know, it's we, we, not. we hear that with pirates. You know, ah, oh, Grog and Rotgut. Uh, uh, it's not uh, Grog. Grog is. Um, isn't that is just really, really, really shitty Irish Grog? Uh, sugar cane, not quite rum. Yes. Uh, no, it's not Groot. No. Uh, oh man, what the heck is it called? Although I wonder if you could make a beer out of parts of Groot, how it would taste. It'd probably be oh, pretty no. interesting. Um, I've heard, I've heard <laughs> it used actually uh, because Go it's hard. herbal. Oh man, what the heck is it called? Right. Killing me. I mean, there's lots of shandies and things, and those are mixes of juices and beers. And mm. They're abominations. There's Don't do that to your beer. Name for the apple thing. Uh, we'll find it and we'll, we'll bring it up at some point. Um, but anyway. Yeah, uh, because, you know, because at least one of us isn't going to be able to sleep tonight until I figure it out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so, uh, so society. Oh, by the way, this is the reference manual for. I apologize for my dog if you guys can hear her. <laughs> that, that's fine. How to Brew by John Palmer. That, Is that, that like I've, I've been I've been in breweries that ship beer all across the country, and there's a copy of that book sitting on the brewmaster's desk. So that that is the core rule book for brewing. Yeah, yeah. There okay. there are a couple of books that are sort of recognized by by home brewers and pro brewers alike across the planet as being near biblical the, in yeah, there the, the middle they're the they're the dm guide as you, if you yeah. will uh that's one of them how to brew by john palmer the other one is i've got it hiding around here somebody it's uh, it's it's written by the oh, uh, dude that's 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 cool mnemonica um every, like we're the, the cool thing about beer is it's it's not an elitist sport and even no. Far from Even a, a, a small bit of knowledge, like there, there's a really good chance because the world is so large, you might know stuff that neither of us know, and, and vice versa. And, and it's about the, um, and that's part of the the brewing of beer culture mm. is you you pass those things on. Like um, as a, a home brewer and a beer enthusiast. Um, I I can call up or, or pop into a, a local craft brewery. Some of them I know, or go to like a home brewers club meeting and like pop into a brewery and hang out and see their systems. And you know, it, it, it's very hard to find a person that brews beer that's a dick. I, you know what, I uh, you you had published a video. On, on how to make a, a home brewing kit it was for five hundred dollars it was the it was everything yeah and yeah. and and I, I remember that phrase from the video that you sent and and I, I do 
I smiled and I enjoyed it because even though I don't, I, I don't rub elbows in the brewing community, as I rub elbows in a gaming community or another hobbyist community or something that invokes creativity in people, you yeah. do find that uh, there are uh, there are people who are, are just more genuine or down to earth about their crafts. Um, and, and, and they treat it as something they want to share, not necessarily as a competition. Because honestly, how, how, how can any of you say that there is the best beer out there? Because oh, how many varieties of beer are there? Was well, it the best chocolate beer? Is it the best, uh, you know, is it the best IPA? Is it the best whatever, whatever, whatever? I can, I can tell you what the, the best beer is. So can I. It's going to be this it's one the, right here. It's the, the one that the you next got one in hand. The one you have in your hand? Ah. <laughs> the best beer is always the one you have in your yeah. I think part of the or, reason or the next for that, beer. or the next beer, but I think part of the reason for that is that it, and, and without getting into the darker side um, of alcohol and, and its history, yeah. um, because there is a, a very dark side. And um, empires were built on tax dollars from alcohol. <sighs> Mm. And and empires were destroyed. Yeah, uh, one's getting and, destroyed and, right now and, from it. And fairly modern ones too. Um, <laughs> if you take those sort of edge cases out, what you come down to is a beverage that is the common the common man's beverage. And I don't mean that to be, you know Mankind. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, it is it is the commoner's beverage. And that means that in every inn and every farmhouse from coast to coast, every, north to south, east to west, chances are there's somebody there who's got a beer and is willing to share one. Mm -hmm. and, and, that's, and that's the thing, right, is um, every Easy homestead shlomo. every homestead made their own beer or their own mead or, or, or whatever, their own because they couldn't trust the water. Mm -hmm. So you could go into any within reason building that, that people existed in, and there would be some form of alcoholic beer beverage. Which but, also, which also in, in, interestingly enough, and I hadn't considered this until now, but it also made it a beverage that wasn't expensive. Hmm. Very much not. Because you could make it with very little. I mean, um, when you look at a batch of beer, five gallons. Um, okay. I did some research a couple of years ago with a malter here in here in Alberta, and we were talking about the amount of grain exactly and right grain, yields, uh, grain yields uh, from typical cultivated land. And... Hmm. You would need for a five gallon batch of beer, so to make five gallons of a five percent, uh, okay. with modern brewing standards, which means much more efficient than it would have been, you know, in, in older times, mm -hmm. but not terribly far off. We would have seen efficiency of 50 or 60 percent starch to sugar extraction. Now we see about 80. 120 square feet is enough land to grow grain for five gallons of beer. Oh. Now, if you take that 120 square feet, how many five-gallon batches can you get out of a mile by a mile? Hmm. <sighs> it works out to around 50,000 hectoliters. Yeah. So about a half a million liters. Of beer, can convert it to American. Uh, uh, half million you know, liters. You call I mean, that, we're talking uh, square feet and miles, and now all of a sudden, you know, the, the efficiency of the metric system is gone. Call that one hundred and twenty-five thousand gallons. Uh, no, I personally measure my car's fuel efficiency and how many yeah. rods to the hog's head I get. But you know, uh, agreed. <laughs> <laughs> Have one over there. Um, yeah. So I mean. A, a small patch of cultivated land makes an extraordinary amount of grain, and if you and if you do that, you play, you know, you 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 
build that batch and you're doing 10 or 20 gallons. And then, I mean, a typical barrel is about 80 gallons, no, 88. 88 gallons. Um, that 88 gallons is, uh, uh, that's enough for, for 400 people. And uh, yeah, I, I think importantly, and, and, and too, uh, the preservation, beer can keep without necessarily any refrigeration, right? So back uh, in, in ye olde yeah. times, it was easier to keep beer longer, like to store it and uh, put it away, yes? In in old in older times, I would argue that um, hops were yeah, not um, used as a preservative until yeah. maybe the 1600s, 1500s, give or take. Or, yeah, mid mid 1500s, Greg. Yeah, um, but um, the, the reason the reason that you know the beer Stella Artois, um, Stella Artois was one of the first breweries about. 250, 220 years ago mm. that figured out how to keep beer fresh for six months. Huh. No. There were a number of there were a number of herbs used uh, <laughs> prior to the cultivation of hops um, as a as a primary preservative. Um, and even then, they were used as a preservative, not as a flavor additive. They weren't put in to make the beer bitter, hmm. <laughs> keep the beer longer. Um, it's only over the last maybe 150 years that that brewers have played with hops to make it more or less bitter. And, um, and now hops is is a sport. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah. <laughs> a sport. A sport. <laughs> Uh, dude. Who can make the bitterest beer? Oh, Who can okay. make the, the rip your face offest IPA? Who can yeah, the most make IBUs the most repugnant tasting piece of shit? Um, it's okay. That's part of the game. Um, that sort of is is the other side of the whole concept of beer. Yeah. Once you get past the fact that it exists as a beverage, then you take the next step and you say, okay, like anything else, we put in our face holes. How do we make it taste better for us? Yeah. And that's where um, I think that's really the moment where you look at, okay, what has changed in beer in the last 400 years or 350 years? That is learning how to treat the grain to get different flavors, to get different uh, uh, efficiency, to learn how to create. How do you make a beer that tastes like caramel? And one that tastes like chocolate. Uh, Chomo brings up a question. So how do you drink beer in the winter in the Middle Ages? Uh, it's ah. it's indoors. Yep. And right. um, you're still heating up water. So you're still taking the snow. And yep, still melting it over all, the fire. All that you require isn't like you don't require a perfectly freshly cut grain grain will hold up in the right conditions in the in the in the right situations but uh, even if you don't have a continued grain source all you need is something that has sugar in it so what you can do is you can create um an uh like uh how do i explain um uh, primitive extract kits, Craig. Uh, it's called honey. I suspect if you if you look at the places in the world where, and this is actually an interesting point, winter um, winter requires definition. Uh, winter in Ireland mm. is different than winter yeah. in Greenland. Hmm. Yeah. Different than winter in Northern Europe. It's different than winter in Central North America. Or Asia, or goodness, you know the equator. So, is it possible to brew in the winter? Absolutely. Um, one of the nice really things pretty. about about um, about brewing, and this is something that people tend to forget, um, and most people who are unfamiliar with brewing wouldn't know it in the first place. Fermentation produces heat, and quite a bit of it. If you had um, if you had 10 or 15, 20 gallons worth of liquid fermenting, you could just about heat a, heat a home with that. 
yeah. uh, because it will raise the temperature of that vessel by five or six degrees centigrade. Oh, there's some awesome questions. Uh, carbonation. That's an interesting yeah. question. Okay. Uh, carbonation um, has existed it's... since the day somebody had a vessel that could be closed and closed airtight. Yeah. Um, so basically, um, our, our friends, the yeast that make the alcohol, they, they do two jobs. Um, they um, eat sugar and they leave one piece CO2 and one piece, it's not exactly that, it's like, but one piece CO2 and one piece alcohol. Uh, so what you have is, like Greg said, as soon as you could get a vessel airtight, the process of creating the alcohol also carbonated the beer. Yeah. The last, um, the, the big change in, in the UK for carbonation um, prior to the introduction of glass bottles was the, was the, the what, what's what we refer to as a firkin. Um, or or uh, a small wooden keg. Okay. That small wooden keg. Uh, the, Isn't the that where the term cask comes from? Pardon? Isn't that where the term cask comes yes. from? Yes. Yes. Um, a cask is merely a a modern adaptation of a firkin or a larger one. Uh, wine was it's made like a in casks. Third, okay. One third yeah. keg. Uh, but what they are is they're they're you know an oaken barrel uh, that is treated on the inside with flame so that it gets nice and and uh, and hard and impermeable uh, and then tarred usually. Uh, they were sapped um, yeah. so that the okay. charcoal itself would be impervious and then uh, you would also have a sap lining to that firkin. And what would happen is the beer would be made, yes, the brewing indeed. part would be done, Eric. put into the firkin and those sealed barrels with yeah, exactly, exactly, Derek. Uh, the Coopers would uh, would manufacture these barrels to incredibly tight tolerances, uh, and right. they would absolutely, under pressure and temperature, seal right up. Um, and then when they were tapped, and, and we talk about tapping in the old days, that was a wooden um, a wooden uh, spigot, right? Yeah. Uh, those kegs were tapped two ways. They were tapped with a soft pine first uh, uh, through a hole in the side of the keg. So that's why you have a hole in the side of those barrels. Okay. It's because those would be rolled to the top. Okay. And that would be at the top. It would allow you to sample and it would also allow you to keep it sealed. When it was time to tap, you would pound a piece of thin pine into it that's yeah. fairly porous. Okay. It's called, and it's called a spile. That spile yeah. would go in and the excess CO2 would come out through the wood. So that would depressurize it. Because otherwise, if you tried to hammer oh. a tap into it, the thing would explode. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, I imagine that was a so, hard lesson learned by someone in the timeline of, I, of I, can tell you, I, <laughs> guarantee, I guarantee you there is a bunch of medieval dudes with only one eye. I can I tell have, you I have experience. Seen, I have I've seen it seen in the last year. Oh, yeah. all right then. This is yeah. still a very common way to, to, to prepare and serve beer. Uh, most craft um, real ale type drinkers, and, and real yeah. ale is something we'll get into at some point, okay. I'm sure, but uh, real ale is ale that is fermented in a firkin or in a cask and then tapped to be consumed immediately. It's not, once that thing is open, it's open. Okay, You can't close it back up. You can stop the beer from flowing, but from that moment on, it's losing carbonation. It's going to go off. Um, and so, uh, yeah, even today, you I've seen people with a hammer and a tap, and that tap doesn't go in right. There's 35-foot geysers of beer. Uh, <laughs> it it uh, seems it's glorious. When, you, when you're at an event. <laughs> it's extraordinary. And, and it's, it's a keg, a, a cask event, and somebody whacks a, a cask incorrectly. Yeah. And you're outside, inside of a tent, and then there's like eight adults holding a spewing metal thing and running for the tent door. I'm not even going to talk about what you just looked like. Uh, so rolling I'll ones do happen in real life, too. 
Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that those firkins are when the first carbonation really started to show up. And it did. It changed the way people appreciate the drink. Mm. Um, it tastes totally, totally different. Um, a, a flat beer that's uncarbonated um, is missing something very specific. Uh, hey. Like Luke said, uh, yeast do three things. Uh, they ingest sugar, they piss alcohol, and they fart CO2. It's that simple. That's, that's it. Now, they embark on other there. things. Life on this planet would not exist. Yeah. At least in its present form, without yeast. Yeah, absolutely true. Um, and so, you know, could it be done? Absolutely could be done without magic. Uh, the first oh, yeah. Coopers, the first Coopers, um, that's that's 400 years ago. Barrel okay, making um, must be done. I just I just saw a uh, a thing recently um, that they uncovered um, what they thought was a maltery, which is how you get the grain to mm. be able to make beer. That was like like six thousand BC or something like that, Craig. Yep. Yeah, it would have been close to that, six to seven thousand. Yeah, and like there there weren't you know. Stainless steel pots and work chillers. And... No, it was clay pots. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, heated slowly to avoid them cracking because they would crack with frightening regularity. Yeah. Um, and then that beer would be packaged in pitchers, big, you know, amphoros pitchers, uh, like you'd yeah. see in old Greek texts and things like okay. that. Those have been around since Egyptian times. Um, and there was some discussion at one point. Um, Patrick McGovern is a cultural yeah. anthropologist, and he did a lot of work discovering sort of ancient um, ancient beers, for lack of a better term, but they were made with grain, so they're a beer. Um, and, and some of the work he did showed that they had vessels that would likely retain some pressure. Uh, it doesn't have to be much. Even just, yeah. just the process of fermentation will actually carbonate uh, beer to a level. It's low, yeah. but it's there. And, and, um, and you would have to think, like, um, all that airtight has to be, like, you don't have to, you know, dive to 4,000 feet and, and have no air. Like, it's the, the weight of the atmosphere three yeah. times mm. is yeah. the super bubbly Budweiser that you know. Yeah. Uh, Derek, uh, that's a really interesting point. Um and, and an understanding of the technology. Um, yeah. Let's, uh, I mean, Maddie, do you want to take that? Where, where do you want to take the next, so, the next phase of this conversation? Uh, what, what I would like to do, uh, Derek, uh, Derek uh, beat me to it. And that's a, that's a compliment to him. Cause I, I think we were thinking along the same lines here. What I'd like to do after this segment um, where, we're, you know, we're talking intro stuff. You have certainly uh, shown people that, you know, your stuff, uh, this isn't just, you know, uh, a lazy thing for you. This is a passion. Um, oh, no, no, it's but, absolutely but a lazy thing, what, and we're both stupid as a stick. Well, <laughs> then you know what? You have awesome charisma scores, brothers, because you you're you doing an awesome job. Um, what I would actually that, like I to do like shit. in our next segment is to to go over with you all and say, all right, uh, let's let's load up in our brains generic Western fantasy world. And there's yep. a tavern. Yeah. Adventurers are here drinking ale or whatever. And yep. what I want you to do is to go through the process of what what does this town, let alone the world or culture, need? But what I'm would going, you find in this in. town in order to put a mug of ale in an adventurer's hand? Because that ale didn't just appear out of nowhere. Well, I mean, if magic exists. But uh, what... You know, you're talking about uh, grains and farms and all this other stuff. And so, what I wanted to do is is kind of build build an economy and build a culture or a structure of uh, a fantasy town that can serve an ale in an inn, and go over wh what would be there, right? If you're a DM and you're stuck, uh, and you say, "Well, uh, the, the common hook is we're gonna we're gonna start the adventure in the tavern, and everyone's gonna have uh, is gonna have an ale because that's just what you do in D and D." Yeah you can come up with so much content because the town is going to have to have 
uh, Coopers, Millers. By the way, these are very common names of, of people yep. because you were named after what you did. Really, really good um, blacksmith. And, 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 and so I want to get into detail in that in our next segment. Um, a, a field and farmers, right, Shlomo? I, I would hope so, at least. <laughs> yeah. Those are a guarantee. I think that's I think that's an important point to note, um, and 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 a good point to sort of finish up the sort of the the you know the really rough and vague. And by all means, you know Luke and I are available on Saturday nights. Come by and ask whatever questions you've got uh, that we don't get to. But um, specific to this cultural discussion of 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 beer and and the history of beer in in culture and society, it it has been widely credited. Um, beer, the beverage, um, or whatever bread-like drink you choose to yeah. uh, to call it, um, has been widely credited, um, and and is very likely. Um, I'd say I, I I'd go so far as to say it's it's credible. Um, the reason that that towns exist. Uh, is almost exclusively come down and the shift from um, a nomadic lifestyle to a sedentary location lifestyle, an urban lifestyle, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, is 100% the response yes. to a beverage that replaces water. Mm -hmm. In order the, to the, the this reason, the reason train. that we stop, the reason that we stopped being hunter gatherer is because we ran out of water so we had to make beer and we needed to plow and till fields to make the beer and bread. So we established we established residences by those fields for convenience and then places to purchase the beer that was made and so on and so forth stemmed so it was it, um, it was the catalyst of how life stopped being hunter gatherers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To to answer that question, Mister Plunderfoot, yes, whiskey is liquid gold, uh, particularly good peated Scotch whiskey. Mm -hmm. uh, the well, it's not smoky. The very same product that I am drinking in my glass. Uh, if this had instead of being put into a keg. And um, tapped right behind me on that fridge with those taps. Um, if it had instead been put into a dis into a still, uh, it would be raw whiskey. Um, yeah. There is no functional difference between beer and hard spirits. It's uh, with when, the when exception you say... of the process. Sorry, to cut you off, Greg. Yes, good Eilish Scotch is a wonderful thing. Yeah, go ahead. And, and <laughs> I lay scotch, or, or is lay, as it's most commonly incorrectly pronounced. Um, that's, <laughs> I did that's that. Just a, that's just a region um, a, in Scotland where the, the is lays, or oops, call it the is lays. It's a special um, place where the peat is exceptionally thick and yeah. very flavor. <laughs> yeah. Actually, whiskey without the E is only scotch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else is misspelling it. Um, yeah, it, it, and, and I don't. I don't put a lot of. I, I'm not one of those arrogant whiskey people. I like. <laughs> and you're right. It's Isla. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I like. Uh, I like a good scotch, but I also like a good whiskey. And and I do treat them separately, but I don't treat either with reverence. So you know what I like is a good bio break. Yeah, I, I we'll we'll take that. If I if I can throw out one last question to you, and then we'll take a ten minute break Absolutely. or so. Sounds um, good. So you all uh, you you've gone through this. You 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 talked about your origin story. You've gotten together. You've done all this research. You've been brewing on your own. You're enjoying it. You're selling it. You, the name of your business is is risky. R R Y S K Y. Uh, Correct. Can, can you get into look? It, it, we're talking about names have meanings, and there's different meanings to different scotches and whiskeys and all this other stuff. What is the meaning to your name? And and then we'll okay. we'll take a break after this. So so uh, Luke, I'll, I'll run <laughs> with <is> Greg. <laughs> yeah, this is all this is all me. Uh, four years ago, five years ago, when I started um, really actively brewing, 
um, I, I created a home brewery called brewery called Three Boys. Uh, now, at the time, I was not aware of the Three Boys Brewery in New Zealand, uh, and uh, they, they make better beer than you. Yeah, they do. And <laughs> and I wasn't and I wasn't really um, sure of where I was going um, when uh, Luke and I started doing um, our live casts um, a number of years ago now. Um, beer was a big part of that. And, and yeah. we both sort of had gotten to this point in our history where we both sort of said, you know what, if money was no object, if I had a million dollars in my back pocket, mm -hmm. what would I do for a job tomorrow? And we both answered the same thing. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, what well, would I do for a job? In Alberta. Awesome. Good night. <laughs> uh, what would I do for a job tomorrow? We'd open a brewery. Yeah. Um, we'd hire somebody really good and we'd have them as our brewmaster and then we would be the mad scientists who came up with stupid ideas and we would do that. And so knowing that that was something we wanted to build, we went, okay, well, how can we do that? Well, we can do that with YouTube. We can do that with live streaming. We can crowdsource. Let's see if we can make it happen. And we went into it with that intent. And so we created Risk. Um, and Risk Brewing Company, um, the reason the name came up... Dude, the Bat 50 is great. The Bat 50 is awesome. I uh, still drink 50. It's <laughs> water. Fantastic. Um, risk is a Scandinavian word. Okay. <laughs> this is where you lose me. Um, so what I, when I looked at this, here's some, here's some hard and unpleasant facts when it comes to brewing. Uh, it's one, really hard to get a four-letter domain. That that too. One out of every three breweries that opens will be closed inside 18 months. Period. Full stop. End of discussion. Yeah. The average brewery in North America, outside of Labatt's, a.k.a. AB InBev, Sapporo, or Miller Coors, uh, takes a minimum of three years to turn a profit. profit. That does not mean pay back the people who built it. That means turn a profit. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to build a brewery and you've got $150,000 in your back pocket, I can spend that shit inside three months. Oh, dude, I could spend $150,000 And you will see it come back brewery. to you in five years if I do everything right. So yeah. creating a brewery is not only a, a, an act of passion and an act of love, but it is green. big ass risk. Yeah. So back to the word. Yeah. So the risk was what I what I saw. If we were ever going to do it, we were taking a risk. Yep. R Y S K is a Scandinavian word that means out of your head crazy. And the way I saw it, if you're going to do this, <laughs> you have got to be out of your head crazy. Yeah, and if, two, if two husbands and fathers could put together a million bucks to do this and we actually do it, we're going to be crazy. Like, we're going to do it. But we're crazy. We'll, we'll be, we're, we're crazy people. So at this point, uh, we don't sell. But you got it right. Uh, but we Under produce point. and we partner and we spend time with real brewers and we work on recipes with real brewers. And if in a year we see our name on a tap, that's got our beer that was made by another guy who we hang out with. I will buy then everybody in the bar. My beer. Until, until, until that until that keg is empty, I'm buying right. it for people. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, you know, so the long-term dream is to do this, to build a brewery, yeah. to, to create an actual product that we can sell and ship worldwide. Uh, the truth is, it's a really unlikely thing to happen. Uh, hey, it, is a, it is a specific set of circumstances that support that dream happening. Uh, yeah. Right now, I'm a father of two, both of them under 13. Luke's got a little one under 10. Uh, we're not in a position to, to give up the house or yeah. risk it. Yeah. Uh, but we'll play the game, and we'll teach, and we'll learn, and we'll share uh, along the way, and, uh, and if, side, and if side somebody side drops a bag of cash out of a helicopter, well, then we're talking. <laughs> it's going to um, get risky. 
It one third survive, two thirds close. Yep. Yeah. Those are. It varies industry to industry, but yeah. that's that's for almost anything you do. You want to open a restaurant. You want to open up a, a, a mom and pa store. A, a cheese, yeah. uh, a, like a, yeah. a, a a gentrified cheese shop downtown. Yeah. Um, you're looking at those numbers. The well, difference, the big difference is when you're looking at production scale for brewing, uh, you're going to spend $50,000 on the stainless steel to make one batch and store yeah. one batch. When I was pursuing my master's degree in, um, in uh, executive business management, uh, my group uh, studied Lagunitas as a business case. Yeah, excellent and, uh, case. And it terrible really, stuff happened to Lagunitas. It, that was, it was an interesting... It was very interesting, and you know what? The the whole I, I don't know if the if it if it is a bubble or if it's ready to burst, and it has or it won't. But microbrewing or independent breweries uh, are are doing very well and have taken a big market share. But I, they, 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 that's that's business stuff. I think we can take a ten minute break though first. You bet. And then uh, sounds we'll, good. Because uh, hey, we have this next segment coming up, and we can talk. We can certainly talk about that because maybe this fantasy inn we're talking about is on hard times, and and you know we, we develop a countryside, and we say, well, how can we improve it or go from there? And of course, we have tomorrow uh, to continue talking about this. So uh, everyone, hang tight. Let's take a ten minute break, um, and we'll come pie. back and 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 we'll talk fantasy more regularly than interspersing it in with what we're doing. Sounds good. Absolutely. All right, thank you guys. Uh, I'll I'm gonna take a ten minute break here myself, and I will uh, I, I will BRB.